Well, thank you, Dawn. Thank you, Janice. Um, can you guys hear me okay in the back? Excellent. Um, yeah, we don't, for as close as the Blackfoot Challenge and the Blackfoot Watershed is to Helena, I feel like we don't get into this town enough. And so I really appreciate uh, Dawn's invitation. This is a really cool series, this natural history series. I wish I lived closer so I could catch the other ones. I'd love to learn more about what the happens on the MPG Ranch. Um, and we do have, I think we're, we're breaking into the Helena scene with a couple of pint nights this summer. So I encourage you to, uh, I have a sign-up sheet over here. Um, we are still offering hard mailing as an option. I appreciate how, how hard hardline Janice is about email. We sh we're getting there. But if um, you would like to sign up, email or mailing address. Membership is free to be a part of the Blackfoot Challenge. Just um, an appreciation for the approach that we take to conservation. Um, so hopefully we'll see you at some of your outstanding breweries this summer. Um, so I'm the outreach coordinator for the Blackfoot Challenge. I have been for the last four and a half years. I also dabble in our conservation strategies committee and have helped uh, coordinate the education program a little bit over the years and also help coordinate uh, what is called the Blackfoot Community Conservation Area Council, which I will get into in a little bit. Um, so tonight, I encourage this to be a very interactive uh, presentation. If you guys have questions or if I'm skimming over something, and you'd like me to go into it a little bit more, just raise your hand and let me know to stop and just ask. Just ask. Um, I'm going to grab my phone to make sure. Oh, no, there's a clock right there. Make sure I stay on time. Um, so I'm going to talk a little bit about the history of the Blackfoot Challenge. I think that's really important to who the Blackfoot Challenge is today. Um, our approach and then also some of the on-the-ground solutions that um, have been enacted over the last 20 years that have led to the reason why the Blackfoot looks the way it does, like Dawn mentioned. So um, just a couple slides to orient us to where the Blackfoot watershed is. 1.5 million acres uh, at the southern edge of the crown of the continent ecosystem. One of the most ecologically and biologically intact ecosystems left in the entire world, as probably many of you know. Um, Just to kind of point out the, the watershed itself, like I said, 1.5 million acres. The Blackfoot, watershed, or the Blackfoot River begins at Rogers Pass, um, flows 132 miles west towards Missoula, towards its confluence with the Clark Fork River in Bonner. Split between three counties, Missoula, Powell, Lewis, and Clark, um, just some of the major tributaries to the, to the, to the river, and can also note from this slide, 80% of the watershed is forested. Um, and you have the very productive croplands and grasslands down in the, in the valley bottoms, also some of your prime wildlife habitat. So this is a land ownership uh, map, probably not uncommon for a lot of areas in the west of Montana and in the Rocky Mountain West. And you may be able to infer why the Blackfoot Challenge got its name from this slide. <laughs> So there's a uh, woman named Becky Garland who helped found not only the Blackfoot Challenge, but also a handful of years previous to the challenge, the big Blackfoot chapter of Trout Unlimited. Um, lifetime resident of Lincoln, her father helped establish the scapegoat wilderness. In the early 90s, when they were beginning to discuss the idea of forming a group that could help bring all these folks together, uh, rolled out a land ownership map, and, and Becky said, this is going to be a challenge. But what we realized over the years is that challenge is actually an opportunity. And um, so today we have the Blackfoot opportunity. So it was a, so, so when I talk to um, Becky Garland and Lan Lindbergh, also one of the founders of the Blackfoot Challenge, they'll talk about how, um, you know, Sarah, it wasn't just a matter of getting private landowners and public land managers talking to one another. It was a matter of getting those private landowners to talk to one another and public agencies to talk to one another, and not even just agency to agency, but actually intra-agency too. They said sometimes people just weren't even on the same page within their own agencies. And if we wanted to somehow have a you know, cooperative approach and get a handle on what's going on in our watershed, we got we to gotta bring these people together. We got to communicate a little bit better. Um, so just the landscape of the watershed. Uh, you have these high alpine forests, 
abutting up against these productive valley bottoms, great wetland habitat, um, numerous wildlife species. The Blackfoot watershed is now home to every species that was there when Lewis returned home um, east through the Blackfoot River Valley. He noted as in his journals the presence of trumpeter swans, which I'm sure everyone here knows. Those are. Um, and since 2003, the Blackfoot Challenge has been involved in a program to restore trumpeter swans to the Blackfoot watershed, and they have now been nesting in the watershed since 2011, I think, for the first time in possibly 200 years since when Lewis saw them. <clears throat> so in the early, late 80s, early 90s, a number of resource threats started coming down the pike. Um, land use changes, uh, increase in land values, recognized for their residential development potential. Um, I think that development started happening a little faster down in the Bitterroots than it did in, in the Blackfoot area. And the folks who lived in the Blackfoot area started seeing that happening. And part of the impetus, I think, for the challenge was, is there a way we could maybe get ahead of that and could just control that development if it's coming our way? Because it, it probably is. Um, recreation has been a huge, made a huge impact on the, on the Blackfoot watershed over the years. Fly, fishers in the, fly fishermen in the area um, call this the summer tuber hatch. <laughs> and I think it's been happening really since the 70s. Um, a lot of, so, so it's just increasing recreation both on the river, fishing, and hunting. Um, history of unsustainable mining practices, tailings left out, um, metal leaching into the waterways, I think. One of the earliest studies that BBCTU, or the Trout Unlimited chapter, the big Blackfoot Trout Unlimited, Unlimited chapter, found that the fisheries in the Blackfoot were degraded by 80%. Um, and a lot of that work, the restoration work that they've undertaken has been in just all those tributaries to the Blackfoot River, where it was threatening the, the, the habitat. Unsustainable grazing practices, complete lack of riparian areas. Um, at the time, the largest uh, private landowner in the watershed was um, Plum Creek Timber Company. Mm -hmm. So um, maybe more of a focus on profit maximization than, than sustainable harvesting. And uh, weeds, number one common enemy, enemy in Montana. So all these resource threats were coming down the pike. Folks knew it. Um, they recognized what was going on. In the early 90s, American Rivers listed the, the big, the big uh, Blackfoot River as one of the top 10 most endangered rivers in the country. And I think folks had a hunch and I think weren't totally surprised, but realized that something needed to be done. Um, so some of the leaders in the area, like Becky Garland and Lynn Lindberg and Jim Stone, started getting folks together and asking them if, um, one, are you at all concerned about what's happening? Two, do you think there's something we can do about it? And does it make any sense to form some sort of group that can coordinate all of us together to help come up with a consensus approach to tackle some of these issues? And people said, yes, we want to take these matters into our own hands. So um, the Blackfoot Challenge was officially chartered as a nonprofit in 1993 to coordinate efforts to conserve and enhance the natural resources and the rural way of life in the Blackfoot watershed. I think the key word in that mission is that we coordinate. We coordinate all the conservation and the enhancement. Right? So we're, we bring all these diverse partnerships together. Um, and the Blackfoot Challenge has focused from the beginning on a ridge top to ridge top approach, kind of complementing the work of our partner in Trout Unlimited, so taking into account the diversity of, of land and water and wildlife resources. And uh, what has now become known as the community-based approach to conservation is the key that got us to where we are today in the Blackfoot. Um, it has some different names, collaborative conservation or cooperative conservation, which is what I used on the front, um, the front slide. So just some of the tenets of what this approach is. Uh, it's inclusive. So it invites participation by all stakeholders, public and private, um, not only you know, landowners and land managers, um, but the people who live, work, recreate in the Blackfoot. Uh, lead with community values, you support with science. Just meeting 
a lot of the biologists who maybe come to work in the Blackfoot Valley, it's science that brought them there. But if they had knocked on Rancher Jim Stone's door and said, you know, Jim, you're doing things wrong. Uh, you're, you need some help with you know, your management practices. The relationship probably wouldn't have gotten very far. So instead, um, Greg Nidecker is who I'm thinking of in my head. He works for the Fish and Wildlife Service. And maybe some of you guys have heard of him. Um, works for the Partners of Fish and Wildlife Program, which is kind of the partner um, private land conservation branch of the Fish and Wildlife Service. They came in with the approach asking the landowners what they could do to help them out. And that was it. Just what can we do? Is there anything we can do to help you? Just the, uh, the importance of building that relationship first to be able to work on conservation later together. And then we utilize a number of techniques. So the Blackfoot Challenge focuses on the 80-20 rule. Um, a rancher named David Mannix out of Helmville introduced this uh, to the challenge when he came on the board, that why don't we start by focusing on the 80% that we have in common, not the 20% that divides. So focusing on shared values and recognizing that what we have in common is probably greater than what we don't have in common. So those, the proportion is um, very intentional. And that doesn't mean the 20% isn't important. But what we need to do is like build some, build our relationship, build some trust, get to know you, you get to know me first. Let's tackle what we have in common, such as weeds. We can both identify that we want to get rid of those. And then maybe we can come back to something like wolves later. How far along are you in the 80-20? Hmm. We're, we started the 20. I think we're tackling the 20. Yeah, good question. Um, but a part of that is new, you know, new people are coming to the table all the time. And so maybe you have to, you know, revisit the 80. Yeah, good question. Um, we talk a lot about not getting ahead of your partners and continuous communication. So it's just, you know, I, they seem simple, but um, a lot of what the, the Blackfoot Challenge does is transferability. So a lot of people knock on our door and ask, you know, it's just great what, what, what's happened in the Blackfoot watershed. How can, how can we do that in our neck of the woods? And so much of it is just depends on this, this personal relationship building stuff. Um, so I do spend a little time on it. Um, including a coordinating framework, that is the Blackfoot Challenge. So actually establishing an organization with staff who can coordinate these conversations, pull together meetings, take minutes, record those minutes, represent it to everybody. You know, the importance of this group memory, making sure we're all on the same page. Um, and then also, Blackfoot Challenge staff to be able to deliver those, those lasting solutions on the ground along with our partners. And then just by following this process, it's just a relationship, or it's just a process of, of building relationships, building trust and credibility. So you start delivering success, success breeds success. Um, so are there any questions on any of this before I move on to some of the actual solutions? How are you? How are you? Yeah. Great. <laughs> Sure, so it varies um, quite a bit every year. So in 2015, I think we were 60% public money. Two years ago, it was about 40% public money. Um, I would say that's a, a large portion of our budget is, is actually the forestry. So from that, um, a lot of it is federal funded through the state DNRC to the Blackfoot Challenge. Um, and then quite a few private foundation grants a little bit of individual fundraising, a little bit of corporate. I don't think I'm missing too much. Yeah. Um, so just the Blackfoot Challenge, we, um, our board is, is made up of every, every public land manager um, that manages land within the boundaries of the Blackfoot watershed has this permanent seat on the board of the Blackfoot Challenge. Um, the chair is a rancher out of Ovando. Um, also a couple of other ranchers from other parts of the watershed, smaller acreage landowners, private businesses, um, educators, the Nature Conservancy. And so we're a board-led organization and then underneath the board there are various, I think there's seven different committees. And every committee is chaired by a board member. So kind of a, just a framework that kind of keeps us connected to what's going on on the ground. So one of the first committees that the Blackfoot Challenge established was the Weeds Committee. Again, focusing on that 80%, not the 20%. Um, 
utilize a diversity of methods, um, have now established 12, or 13, I think, 13 vegetation management areas within the Blackfoot watershed. So there's a local landowner who's appointed as the leader and helps kind of the, coordinate the approach taking, that's being taken in that area. We're working on one right now up in the Lincoln area. Um, our education committee was also one of the first committees that was formed. I think in the early 90s it was more adult education, things like conservation easements, estate planning, water rights, weed management. And then in the 2000s, the early 2000s, began incorporating um, place-based education for youth and do a number of activities um, every year, like our trumpeter swan releases. Gilly trumpeter, you guys, yeah, you all know, trumpeter swan is such a large bird, they don't appear to be too affected by the presence of humans, so, so the teachers from the watershed will actually release birds on behalf of their, their classes. Like um, Gina Davis in the right here, um, with the guy that some of you may know, and uh, releasing birds on behalf of Potomac School. We also have an annual youth field day, uh, bring students out, very, just rotating topics. Um, average probably about 150 students at each of those. There's seven rural watershed, or seven rural schools within the watershed, ranging from some years one student at one of those schools up to um, a couple hundred. And so we have great participation um, from our teachers, and we utilize a teacher steering council where we meet two times a year with the teachers in the valley, and they tell us what sort of programs would be most helpful and most complement you know, the mandates that are coming from the state for them. Um, our Water Resources Committee. Uh, this developed formally in the early 2000s as well. Um, I think 12 or 13 of the last 16 years have been drought years in the Blackfoot watershed. So landowners um, begin recognizing that there may be an opportunity to get ahead of this. If we can, drought is, is coming down the pike and we may have an opportunity to start working together instead of turning to conflict later. Um, so it's about just balancing water needs during low summer flows and between endangered, uh, the, the bull trout, which I believe is endangered or threatened, uh, West Slope cutthroat trout, the irrigators, and then the angling community. It also makes their living off of the ability to fish. Um, yeah, so we have a, uh, we coordinate a drought, um, well, it's a drought committee, and they've put together a drought plan for the Blackfoot watershed. So one overarching plan with a number of triggers. Um, Fish, Wildlife, and Parks actually owns an in-stream right at the mouth of the Blackfoot River, at the mouth of the Blackfoot River, dated 1971. And so um, once river flows fall before 700, 700, below 700 CFS in the summer, they have the right to call on any irrigators that are junior to that right. Um, but there are over a hundred individualized drought plans within the Blackfoot watershed. And if landowners are participating actively in their drought plan during a drought year, Montana Fish, Wildlife, and Parks has agreed to not call them on their water. Um, so this is, it's a, I think our drought committee met once a week during the drought season last year. So it's constantly looking at conditions, constantly adapting and, and implementing drought plans as they needed to be. Our wildlife committee, um, probably one of our more well-known um, committees. In the early 2000s, um, as grizzly bears began recovering on the landscape, um, started coming down onto valley ranches. I think in 2001, a hunter on the Blackfoot game range was killed by a grizzly bear after leaving an elk carcass and coming back to it. And there was a grizzly bear on it. And I think this event, it was recognized again that increasing grizzly presence in the area, coming onto our ranches, coming close to our homes and our families, conflicts are going to happen and maybe there's an opportunity again to get out ahead of this in a proactive, preventative, voluntary way. Um, so every calving season, we're in the middle of calving season right now in the Blackfoot, um, there's a natural amount of death loss. So every farmer will lose, every rancher will lose a certain number of calves, and traditionally they would just pull those out into the boneyard on the back of the ranch. And 
not have to really worry about them. Well, with the return of carnivores on the landscape, that's essentially a welcome mat uh, for a free feed. And an increasing number of conflicts began happening. Um, and so what the Blackfoot Challenge, our wildlife coordinator, Seth Wilson, um, worked alongside uh, watershed ranchers to develop some strategies, such as our carcass pickup program. So since 2003, um, we've been working with Fish and Wildlife Service, with Fish and Wildlife and Parks, different, everybody's offering different resources, funding capacities. Um, and during the calving season, pick up all of the ranches from, or all of the carcasses from Valley Ranches. And I think we have about 95% of ranch owners in the Blackfoot participating in that. Um, so then the question was, well, what do we do with all these carcasses? We used to take them to the landfill in Missoula, but they started to not appreciate that. We needed to come up with something, another alternative. Montana Department of Transportation actually began composting their roadkill. So we, we asked them about being able to compost livestock. And so now um, there's a, in the kind of center part of the watershed at Clearwater Junction, um, we share a, a composting facility with Montana Department of Transportation. All of the wood chips are donated by um, Point Creek Timber, or excuse me, by Pyramid Mountain Lumber, the lumber mill out of Silly Lake. And we are processing probably about 500 carcasses a year um, that are coming off of ranches in the Blackfoot. And this program is also extended into uh, granite and mineral counties as well. So I think we've removed over 6,000 carcasses since the beginning of this program. So other, some other techniques, just simple fencing. So fencing in calving areas, fencing in beehives. Uh, and this particular type of fence is called fladry. The red wa uh, flag waving in the wind de deters wolves. For some reason, for this is, this is specifically used, used um, to surround calving areas in the springtime. And then also range riders, um, which Seth told me actually developed out of a historic pastoral European technique of just establishing human presence near your livestock to create kind of a, a border between predators and, and the livestock. And so variety of methods. Molly here is on her horse. Um, we're lucky to work with Fish, Wildlife, and Parks and have a number of grizzly bears and wolves within the Blackfoot watershed collared. So we're able to monitor where they're at with telemetry. Um, wolves came back into the watershed in about 2007. And I think we now have about 13 active packs, which your pack can range anywhere from one or two wolves to seven or eight maybe is, is, could be as high as that in, in the watershed. Um, so it keeps them busy. This last summer we had one full-time range rider and two part-time range riders working in different parts of the watershed um, covering about 40,000 acres. And so all these strategies combined has led to a 90, 93% decrease in conflicts since 2003. And that ranges from anything such as a confirmed, you know, kill on a calf um, to just uh, a bear digging in your toilet beds or taking your bird, bird feeder down. Um, so we do, we're, we're lucky to, to be able to offer a lot of transferability uh, on our wildlife programs and there's similar programs now developing in the Big Hole, um, Eastern Washington, a number of other places. And um, in a watershed that's 80% forested or forested, our forestry committee became actually largely active in 2008 after the 2007 Jocko Lakes fire, which was a huge, huge fire that um, burned down some houses. And our, um, let's see, so our forestry committee became active then and really focusing on this, what this middle map shows is the wildland urban interface and these red hotspots, most high priority areas. Um, so working just really through word of mouth uh, with landowners throughout the watershed, averaging probably about 500 acres restored fuel, at least um, fuel reduction, restoration treatments every year. And then I kind of left our conservation strategies committee for last to just um, talk about the evolution of our relationship with the Nature Conservancy which is one of the biggest projects that we have going on right now. Um, there's increased conservation activity in the watershed around the turn of the century. 
and um, the Conservation Strategies Committee was established to just coordinate all the different entities working on this as well as the land trusts. Um, so we've pulled together a uh, conservation easement guide. The Blackfoot Challenge does not hold conservation easements, um, but we were with a number of land trusts to kind of more play the liaison between the landowner and the land trust, figuring out what, what, la what landowners' goals are for their property and then connecting them to the appropriate, appropriate entity. Um, I have brought a couple of those guides. Please feel free to take one if you would like. Um, and then this committee really handled all these large land ownership changes in the Blackfoot watershed that have been happening for the last 13 years. Uh, so as Plum Creek Timber Company began, uh, they turned into a real estate investment trust, began to diversify their portfolio and wanted to sell a large amount of their land in the Blackfoot watershed. Uh, excuse me. And um, folks at the Blackfoot Challenge and the Nature Conservancy got this crazy brained idea that uh, why don't we just buy it? And <clears throat> they went out to the communities and there was a, I think a total of 88,000 acres that was up for sale in the watershed at the time and asked what do you think? Should we buy this? Um, if we if we can, you know, you'll have to be a part of the fundraising, um, and the, at least allowing us to control the outcome. And people resoundingly said yes. So, the Blackfoot Community Project began in 2004, and through three phases, the Nature Conservancy purchased what is now 89,000 acres of land from Plum Creek in the watershed, and partnered with the Blackfoot Challenge to rely on a community-based process of determining what the future ownership of those lands was going to look like. So, um, so, that, so there was the requirement, you know, these lands are going to be in permanent conservation status, but uh, what, yeah, didn't know exactly what the, the outcomes would be in terms of private versus public. Um, a number of these parcels were adjacent to private, la private ranches, ranching was happening, so about, I think, tw 20 to 25% of Blackfoot Community Project lands went into private hands with conservation easements on them. And then the other 75% um, <coughs> went into public ownership. Oh. <laughs> and um, a component of this was this new uh, approach to private land conservation uh, where this parcel right in the heart of the Blackfoot watershed, local residents thought that it was a very, it was a very important area for hunting and recreation and I think culturally um, and, and wanted to come up with maybe some different sort of alternative to just strictly private or public. So 5,600 acres in the center of the Ovando area, Ovando Valley, um, is now owned by the Blackfoot Challenge. We, the Blackfoot Challenge holds the deed to the land, but it's managed by a 15-member community council. Um, for multiple uses throughout the year. So everything from um, hunting, snowmobiling, bike riding, timber management, grazing, et cetera. And we actually have a graduate student who is doing his um, thesis on kind of the, maybe help us define some parameters of success about whether or not that model is working. Now 10 years into it. And then our most recent chapter, um, in the beginning of 2015, uh, the Nature Conservancy purchased all of the remaining Plum Creek land in the Blackfoot watershed, which is all this area right here, 117,000 acres, contiguous acres, now known as the Clearwater Blackfoot Project. And due to the um, kind of financial nature of their purchase, they don't have to repay that loan immediately. They have a time span about 10 years to work with the Blackfoot Challenge and the communities to figure out what the permanent ownership of those lands should look like. Um, so that's, as Don mentioned, that's what brought me back to school. And um, pretty, pretty thrilled to be a part of that. They spent the first year doing a lot of uh, resource inventory. And um, I think we're, you know, through the similar, similar format as we do with the Blackfoot Community Project of established work groups and are bringing people together, a lot of community meetings, um, starting to put put the maps up and figure out what the future of those lands should look like and, and which public agencies might be interested, what are their alternatives like the BCCA, are, in, are folks interested in entertaining to maintain some local ownership. 
um, et cetera. And yeah, this is the most current um, ownership map of the Blackfoot watershed today, about right around 170,000 acres of conservation easements in the watershed. And we say 75% of the watershed in conserved status, meaning that either under a conservation easement or public, publicly managed. So. Can you describe the map a bit? You bet. Yeah, like just kind of where, where the stuff is. So, yeah, yeah, sure, absolutely, sorry. So, okay, so Helena, Missoula, um, Blackfoot River kind of follows Highway 200 for the most part. Um, this dark green is the wilderness. So this is the bottom part of the whole Bob Marshall Complex wilderness. This is the scapegoat right here. Um, national forest land, we are, the Blackfoot Watershed has two national forests, the Lolo and what is now the Helena Lewis and Clark National Forest. Um, all of these parcels that you see in the thick border represent either Blackfoot Community Project I kind of skipped it over, skipped over it, but Montana Legacy Project was another phase of the Nature Conservancy ownership, where they purchased from um, Plum Creek. So these two parcels were actually during the, that phase. So up here, this is north of, of Sealy Lake, a large parcel that's now the Marshall Block um, Wildlife Management Area that went to Fish, Wildlife, and Parks. And th this is the, the community of Potomac is right here, and they worked together and convinced the legislature that this parcel of land um, they would like to see in state ownership. So that went from Plum Creek to TNC to state. Uh, the yellow is Bureau of Land Management. This is Chamberlain Mountain. So they acquired kind of quite a few blocks there, um, consolidating that checkerboard ownership. Uh, like I mentioned before, Fish and Wildlife Service is a huge partner in the valley. And these crosshatched acres uh, denote Fish and Wildlife Service conservation easements. So pri um, uh, real productive uh, waterfowl and, and migratory bird habitat in these lower stretches. So um, priority conservation priority for Fish and Wildlife Service there. Um, I don't think I missed any colors. A lot of our, you guys have Prickly Pear Land Trust and we have Five Valleys Land Trust. And they have a, a number of um, easements in the valley, and those are all the red, red hash marks. And then, like I said, this kind of unique piece here that's, that's owned by the Blackfoot Challenge. And then, um, yeah. Sarah, what are the, mm -hmm. can you characterize the restrictions on the easements typically? Sure. Um, varies. Typically, the restriction is development. So. Uh, just no, no construction of extra uh, dwellings, or only maybe one or two that are written into the easement. It really varies, every easement varies and is written personally with the, with the landowner. Um, yeah, does that answer your question? Kind of. Has the access been limited to access easements? And part of the easement is access, but is it public access? Is that an issue? That's a good question. Um, yeah, in cases, in cases. Like I mentioned, because there is, I mean, recreation is such a priority uh, in, in the Blackfoot, and I, I think that people, it depends on the area, but if that area has historically been accessed by the public, um, I, th I do think people are interested in trying to work out if there, if there can be access, continue to be guaranteed within that easement. That's, a, I know, a huge priority for the for these, for this area, the um, in the Clearwater Blackfoot project, it's actually through some of our work group meetings so far that's risen to the top as actually one of the highest priorities to maintain public access if any of it goes into private hands. Mm -hmm. Actually, one of the what's now known as block management areas that monitored, you know, uh, monitored by Fish, Wildlife, and Parks. That's that whole format actually kind of began in the lower part of the watershed. Uh, with some private landowners like Lan Lindbergh and Bill Potter um, working out agreements with Fish, Wildlife, and Parks to allow um, public hunter access onto their land. And it's actually gone really well, Lan says, just because of how much folks have recognized, at least it, you know, it did. It, it's worked, I think, continued it to this day just because people recognize that that's, that's an opportunity to be on those, on those private ranches and actually self-police one another 
quite a bit. Um, and block management is now very common in a lot of areas in the watershed. So do you have any interactions with Paul and Russ people? Yes. Yep. Okay, They're a big, big landowner, big partner. Um, so that, that was traditionally Land's family's ranch. And um, No, they're 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 great. They're new, like you know, they're new landowners. So they're still they're learning learning the systems, and and they're very uh, open to work with us. One of the bigger problems with Pause Up is the high staff turnover. So you know, so much of this work is building relationships with folks, and uh, they just hired some new ranch managers who actually are from Potomac and and have um, a tons tons of the Black for Challenge folks went to their wedding. And so they've, they've been now back and are managing the ranch and really understand, I think, the approach that's taken in this valley and working with neighbors and working with one another. And um, it's, it's been getting better. It's been getting a lot better. So it's the working cattle ranch? It's the working cattle ranch. Yeah, they do have, they do have cattle. It's kind of like there's the guest side, but then there's also um, the, the, one of the owners is very interested in the black, the maximizing the black Angus production. So um, yeah, so they are. And they're lucky to have a couple of pretty knowledgeable ranch managers who, who are very partnership oriented. And they're actually one of our, they have something like 20 irrigation pivots on their ranch and are very, um, very cooperative in their drought plan. Mm -hmm. Yeah, so they're, they're great. Is there any other? Sure, yeah, Don. About 615,000 acres, mm -hmm. you now got to decide what to do with it. Right. Um, <laughs> Mm -hmm. Are there any other leading candidate ideas for uses there? Mm, for uses? For, what can you say about what sure. the community is thinking there? Totally, yeah. So, I mean, one of the reasons that Pullum Creek held on to these lands so long was because of their proximity to the, the lumber mill in, in Sealy Lake. Um, so one of the first things we heard was, you know, this land has been a huge economic factor for these local communities, and we would like to continue to see them to be that. Um, so, <coughs> um, so the Nature Conservancy, you know, it's, I don't know how much harvestable, tim harvestable timber is left on, on this land. They're actually conducting a forest inventory right now. Um, but timber production, I think, is definitely part, will be part of the future of that land. Um, recreation is actually something we've heard, too, is Big, both motorized and non-motorized. Um, spent a lot of spent a lot of work this last summer. Nature Conservancy did um, working on actually some illegal use uh, restoration of trails in that area, and working with the local communities on that. And so I think that designating certain areas um, that are that are most appropriate and most loved for recreation use, motorized recreation use, will be you know a big part of the future of that that area as well. But then, I don't know how many are familiar, but actually on this, I think right here, we're just, no, it's right up here. Um, you uh, run into the Jocko Primitive Area, which is um, private land owned by the Confederated Sage Lish and Kootenai Tribes. And so there's a little bit of interest in maybe establishing more of a border there, um, make sure that their private property rights are, are respected. Um, and I know that in the immediate term, we're, we're already beginning, Bureau of Land Management has some leftover funding from Land and Water Conservation Fund that has to be spent at the end of, oh, I don't know, the end of next year or else it gets taken away. So we're, so we're actually, this is the Blackfoot Recreation Corridor that's owned by the BLM and has been since the 70s, one of the first actually um, purchases out of Plum Creek cans. And they're looking to expand some of the parcels right here and that's actually undergoing appraisal right now. Um, but in, in other term, in other in any other ways in terms of long term uses, I think we're still kind of nebulous. Not exactly sure where and what. So does Plum Creek own any more land in the valley? They don't. Not in the Blackfoot. Oh. And I'm um, well. Plum Creek, which is now actually just all their lands were purchased by a new Weinhauser, I think. Um, yeah, no. No more land in the Blackfoot. So they're gone. So, yeah. Sure. 
Sure. It's a variety of methods. Um, so spraying, I know historically, has been probably one of the biggest um, tools. And like I managed kind of, lo or like I mentioned, man local man managed locally in these vegetation management areas. Um, I know a lot of what they've done on the, the Nature Conservancy land recently and, and also on the BCCA is those, um, the weevils, the root, mm -hmm. the root drilling and the flower eating weevils. Um, I think I've actually been working pretty well. I think that's, you're looking at maybe a 10 year time span to see, see considerable success with that, but um, been incorporating those methods. Any other? Anything? Oh, yeah. Can you talk about any cooperative projects you've done with community members? Yeah. Well, so Pyramid Lumber, it's like a you know, family-run, family-owned uh, lumber mill out of Sealy Lake. Um, Todd Johnson is the son of the, one of the main, the founding owners uh, is on our board. And in terms of cooperative projects, nothing is coming, you know, a specific project. Certainly work with Todd a lot on the, um, on the forestry committee. But specific projects are not, not coming to mind. Yeah, in the back, in the square. Uh, do you feel that you've finished the work here mostly, except for some eucharist, or is there mm. a Great question. Um, uh, you know, I think that's a, it's a neat way to think of it in the terms of the work that we do. Is like, when is the point where the Blackfoot Challenge is not needed anymore, and the communities kind of have this under control, and they're also um, financially you know, able to support their own program these these programs. Um, so far, in my four and a half year tenure, I've only seen the reach of the Blackfoot Challenge grow. I've only seen the amount of work we do grow. Um, <laughs> so, you know, I don't know uh, if we're sunsetting anytime soon. Um, I think that we also have been expanding our reach outside of the Blackfoot watershed, um, sharing our lessons learned with a lot of other neighboring watersheds and regionally and nationally. And so I think there's a role for the Blackfoot Challenge to play in that for, for quite a few years to come. You know, I think we, we think there's a lot of potential for this community-based approach to become the way of doing business. and. Uh, and we're committed to working with decision makers to, to see if it works other places too. Are there other watersheds?